Hello people of the internet, welcome to Paint to Life, episode 55, the YouTube channel where we take tiny plastic miniatures, throw some acrylic paint on there, and breathe life into them with storytelling so you might learn something new on the subject or take the story to make your own. Tonight's episode is a special collaboration of three creators. Renato from Heroes and Beasts Miniatures is the sculptor and inventor of Swap Minis, an exciting brand new type of miniature. Bruce from Bruce's Blacksmith wrote the backstory and created stats for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons for this miniature, and I'm taking both painting it to life, and adding my own flair and direction to that backstory. So, without further ado, I'm GMA Tank, let's get painting. Okay, last time we painted Xavion, the Beholder. If you missed that episode, you can check it out at the end of the video or in the description below. Tonight's miniature is not your typical miniature that we've painted on Paint to Life. It's called a Swap Mini. Swap Minis are available as a print your own STL file through Heroes and Beasts Patreon program where you get two a month. Alternatively, you can purchase the physically printed resin copy and have it shipped to you through Renato's Etsy store. Also, the links are in the description for that as well. But what is a Swap Mini? Basically, it's a miniature with a customizable left hand, right hand, shoulders, chest, back, legs. When you start adding multiple swap minis to your collection, the combinations are limitless. You can take the paladin head and mix it with the orc body, or you can take the demon's wings and clip it on the back of the bard. The pieces attach together with rare earth magnets and they're very fun to play with. Now I painted the mini he sent me, it came from set 2 of the April Patreon rewards. And because there's so many pieces with one swap mini, it's like 5 minis in one. And that's without even adding in pieces from a different swap mini. It's a great opportunity to tell the story of the evolving life of the orc named Sultar. Nomadic wanderers of many races known as the Pack were a group of hunters and scavengers who lived off the land and would descend upon battlefields after great battles to salvage what they could. While they were made up of a variety of humanoid and non-humanoid races, they coexisted peacefully, but there were very few orcs amongst them, if any. This was likely due to the fact that the Pack resided predominantly in orcish territory, so there were many habitual options for stray orcs. Actually, there was one orc, Sultar, the adopted son of the centaur, Ajastus. As a child of only five, Sultar would ask, why am I the only orc amongst us? And Ajastus would wisely say, it didn't matter your size, shape, or color, but all pack members contributed and fought for the survival of the pack. Ajastus told him how he was left in a basket with them. And he shouldn't feel bad, because they're his family now. And family is the most important thing in any clan. Now Sultar was about 10 years old when the pack was visited by members of the largest of the orc clans, the Bloodfangs. Ruled by a veteran war chief named Gugal, the Bloodfang clan was ruthless and savage. They bullied and belittled the pack, making them serve as payment for traveling through Bloodfang territory. But as unpleasant as this visit was, it was also the first time Sultar would lay eyes on a young, curious female orc slightly younger than he. They played for hours throughout the afternoon before she quickly disappeared to her mother's call and he didn't even get her name. Years later, one summer on a hunting expedition, Sultar came upon an old ruined orc settlement. He found old clan symbols. They'd been defaced or weathered with age. It appeared that this was a site of a great battle where many, many died. Curiosity peaked, Sultar traveled to one of the main Bloodfang cities in the region called Orzon to research his findings. Having never been there, seeing a city full of orcs was fascinating to him. The sights, the sounds, the smells, and slaves. He noticed many races enslaved. These races would otherwise be welcomed in his pack, which worried him that the Bloodfang might one day seek to enslave them as well. Ultimately, Sultar finds out that the symbol he found belonged to the Warfang clan. They had been completely annihilated by the Bloodfangs about 20 years ago when they became the dominant clan in the territory. It was a massacre. Many, many, many were killed. While pondering this revelation, the young orc recognizes a girl. It's the girl from his childhood. She's walking on the street. He flags her down. They start to talk and immediately hit it off. This time he has the foresight to get her name. It's Maruk and they have dinner together at a nearby tavern. 
and share stories of their wildly different lifestyles. Sultar asked Maruk if she liked it here in Orzon, to which his surprise she responded that she does not, but that it was her home and that these were her people. People keep me at a distance because I am War Chief Gugal's daughter. Gugal? Gugal has no honor. I would be ashamed to come from such a house. His comment insulted Maruk, and despite immediately apologizing and trying to take it back, he had blown his shot, and she stormed out. Left alone, Sultar began his long trek home. In the decade that followed, more fragmented clans of orcs joined the pack, and Sultar worried that as they grew bigger, they would have attracted the attention of the Bloodfang as a potential threat. And he was right. One spring afternoon, returning home from a hunting expedition, Sultar finds his home raided, with many of his friends and family killed or captured. He finds his adopted father, Ajastus, mortally wounded. The centaur, dying, tells Sultar of his true lineage. He wasn't left in a basket with the pack, but that he was the infant son of the Warfang Warchief and the subject of a great hunt by Gugal Bloodfang. They kept this information from him to protect him, and Ajastus warns him not to tell anyone of his true lineage, or risk having the full might of the Bloodfang clan coming down on him. And lastly, before he died, he passed down his magic great axe, Fury, to his adopted son. It was that day that Sultar vowed revenge. He took the surviving pack members and began raiding and harrying Bloodfang forces. His force ultimately grew bigger, as there were many who wished to fight the increasingly demanding Bloodfangs, and ultimately, he would take the leadership title of General. One fall day, having captured some prisoners, General Sultar recognized one of them, the girl from his past, the daughter of the Bloodfang chieftain, Maruk. Release this prisoner at once. I don't want your freedom. You've led your people to their doom by challenging my clan. She spat at the general. M Maruk, it's me, Sultar. Why are you being so hostile with me? One of your dogs killed my mother during one of your attacks on my people. In dismay, in front of the captured orcs as well as his troops, Sultar told her who he really was, and that it was her father, Gugal, who started this war, and that this is his destiny. I am Sultar, the lost son of the Warfang clan. Your father, Gugal, has no claim over these lands or these people. His reign is over. It was at this exact moment that Maruk looked within herself and realized he was telling the truth and agreed to join him. They spent the night together in the general's tent. But to his dismay in the morning, she was gone. Two years had passed since their rendezvous, and it was obvious that the Bloodfangs knew that the heir to the Warfang clan still lived. Bounties were posted, and assassins were a clear and present danger. War Chief Gugal centralized massive armies and began hunting down this pack. He tried to ambush them, but they were too mobile. It was hard to pin them down to beat them. Additionally, the savagery of the Bloodfangs and the inclusiveness of the pack had turned many in the territory into new recruitments for Sultar's cause. His forces adopted both the Warfang name and clan symbol, and he inducted all who would fight with him into it, making himself Warchief. During the conflict, many Bloodfangs were killed. Some were converted, but ultimately they were all pushed back into their ancestral territory, all the way to their great fortress city, Bogzak. Defeat is imminent and certain. War Chief Sultar accepts Gugal's envoy to discuss terms, and is surprised to see Maruk enter his tent. Maruk, you fled back to your father, and yet here we still are. Sultar, I was ashamed. My father, he's the only family that I have left. I... I thought I could fix things. He is a coward, hunting newborns, risking his only daughter's life rather than just fight me. He knows you won't hurt me, and you will leave our land at once, or you will never meet your son. My, my son? Sultar agreed to withdraw his forces and meet to discuss terms in neutral territory. His advisors warned him of the obvious danger, but he reflected on his life growing up as an orphan and reminded them all that family is always first. Muruk returned to her father, Gugal, inside Bogzak as the Warfang forces withdrew. Did he believe you? Yes, father. They are withdrawing. We will avenge my mother. She smiled, such pride on her face. <laughs> Excellent. 
Good work, daughter. Now we turn the tide. Sultar, War Chief of the Warfang. All right, what did you think of Sultar, the war chief? Here he is in one of his iterations for the shelf. And you can see that the magnets that hold these pieces together are exceptionally strong and hold up to play on tabletop. I also coated them with a matte varnish so that you could handle them without risking clipping or chipping off any of the paint. My entire adventure preparing, assembling, and painting this miniature will be released on Tuesday with my painting video with commentary if you want more information. Swap minis are a very unique idea, and while using magnets on Warhammer for weapon exchange has been around forever, I've yet to see them used in a fantasy set or Dungeons and Dragons where you're not just switching out weapons, but you're outright switching out pieces. And I can imagine that the more swap minis you have, the more permutations that will exist, as I mentioned, and that just makes them a lot of fun. So check out Heroes and Beasts at the link below if you want to learn more. Also in the links below, you can find the original source material for tonight's storytelling source. If you like storytelling as much as I do, check out Bruce's Blacksmith. Not only does he write stories, but he also creates creatures that you can then use in your Dungeons & Dragons campaigns. Head on over to your friendly local gaming store and pick up some paints and brushes and get painting along with us here on Paint to Life. Wave 14 of the Nozzle's Marvelous Miniatures just came out. And while I'm waiting for my next big collaboration to come in the mail, I think next I'm going to paint something given to me by my friendly local gaming store, Phoenix Rising in St. Catharines. So big thanks to Phoenix for supporting the channel. Anyways, that's all I have for this week. I'm GMA Tank. Stay safe, eat healthy, and as always, wash your hands, people. ...of the largest of the orc clans, the Blood Flangs. Oh, named Gugal. The Blood Flang... Blood Flang. Blood, blood Fang. And war chief named Jugal. The Blood Flang... I'm going to say this all night. The Blood Flang... Oh, my God, there's only one L. The Blood Flang... The Blood Fang... Pl <laughs>